Today, we are continuing our collection entitled Changes. Everyone out loud say, I, I want, want to change. change. How many know life is fragile? And I don't wanna waste one moment of my life not becoming who God has called me to become. And here's what I know. I know that change is inevitable, but growth, well, that happens on purpose. And the last few weeks here at Voo Church, we have been centering our talks around this word changes to, to make a change. And I, I kicked off just uh, three weeks ago with this idea of an invitation to change. Last week, I talked to you about the cost of change. And I thought today I would preach to you from the subject, the place of change. Come on, anybody got some faith today that God's gonna speak to us, the place of change. And we're gonna be looking at some verses in Mark chapter one, starting at verse 35, all the way through 45 is where our study is coming from. Uh, as you know, we are on a journey, a six month journey studying the gospel of Mark. Um, anybody out there like me, like in 2021, you're not looking for something catchy. You're looking for something concrete, you know? I, I, I'm looking for something that's sturdy, sturdy ground. And that's why we've committed ourselves to studying the gospel of Mark. And how many know that, that environment matters? You understand that? I mean, like if, if, if you're gonna change, like you need to be in a healthy environment. You need to be in a healthy place. Seed without soil will never grow. Your life is a seed, but if you don't match that seed with some healthy soil, nothing is ever going to come about through it. It's not enough to be full of potential. You have to be planted. This is why the psalmist writes, those that are planted where? in the house of God, they will flourish. It's not enough to want to flourish. It's not enough to start 2021 saying, I desire to be better, I desire to grow. No, you're gonna have to put that desire, that potential, and you're gonna have to plant it somewhere. The psalmist says, if you will get planted in God's house, not transplanted, not deviating through every challenge, but rather say, I'm putting some roots down. I'm gonna put my life, which is a seed, into healthy soil. I believe not overnight, but over time, I will grow. Some of you in 2021, you gotta just get planted. Today is step four of the growth track. Yeah, I love it because whether you're meeting in person or you're watching church online, step four of the growth track is the day that you get empowered to make a difference. Don't just be a spectator at Voo Church. Choose this year to be a participator. Get planted in what God is doing. Setting, it, it matters. Every great story has to have a proper setting. And when I think about my life and I kind of go through all the defining moments of my life, Honestly, every one of those moments is matched with a place. I really couldn't even begin to tell you about all the moments or all the stories without also telling you about the settings attached to those stories. I remember when I first met my wife, Dawn Shree, defining moment. I, I, I remember exactly vividly where I was. I was in a church service. It was really a private school and there was a Christian concert taking place. Uh, both Dontre and I both knew some people that were in the band playing that day in Nashville, Tennessee. And it was one of those kind of stadium seat type of rooms. And I was on the ground floor and somehow Dontre came walking down those steps and I will never forget it. I mean, that day changed my life forever. But every time I walk into a movie theater and I see that kind of like that tiered seating, I'm like, where's my girl? She's about to walk in anywhere. It, 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 the story has a setting attached to it. I remember getting married and come on, man. I remember her walking down the aisle way and there I was, I'm, I'm at the altar. And I don't know about you, but I got married at 22 years of age. That's what Christians do, right? You know, <laughs> if you know what I'm saying, like, like we're just like, all right, I, I don't wanna burn any longer and I don't wanna operate in sin. So I'm gonna get married, okay? Uh, but I was 22, I was really young, really dumb, probably not prepared yet to take on this level of responsibility. And so people talk about the wedding day being the happiest day of their life. And oh my goodness, I just remember everything so vividly. Not me. I, I was about to faint up there. I just remember the whole time, like, don't lock your legs. Like, don't lock your legs. If you see the wedding pictures of me when Don, she's walking down the aisle, you're like, is he happy? Or is he like gonna go down and pass out? I'm like, eh, I'm crying because I'm scared. You know, I'm like, what am I doing? But to this day, when I walk back into that same church and I see those steps, it all of a sudden 
comes back to my memory, the commitment, the vows that I made, the story has a setting. What about our faith journey? I think all of us on our faith journey, we could probably go back to some places. You know, for me as a young man, God shaped my life when I was in middle school and high school. And I can go back to different campgrounds, Cedar Springs Campground or Camp Baraka, where I would lay literally at the front of a stage for hours in a puddle of my own tears, weeping and crying out to God saying, God, if you can use a rock, you can use me. I just wanna be a part of your story. My faith journey has these places along the way. It was the place of change. It was a moment where my my life changed forever. And what you'll find out about God in the Bible is that places matter to God. Like in the Old Testament, there's a cool story where Joshua is leading the Israelite people. Moses has just passed away and now Joshua's transitioned into leadership and he's leading the people into a new territory. And as they're trying to step into what God has for them, there is this Jordan River. Most of us know the story of of the Red Sea being parted for Moses. But what I love about Joshua's story is it reminds me that we all stand on the shoulders of the generations that go before us. And the God who parted the Red Sea for Moses is the same God who stopped the river for Joshua. And Joshua and the Israelites, they walked across on dry ground. And when they got finished, you know what God told them to do? God said, I want you to grab 12 stones from that river and I want you to bring them out and I want you to place them on the ground as a memorial. What was the point of the memorial? The point was, is that every time the Israelite people came and saw those 12 stones stacked, it was to commemorate and remember the place of change. The place where God came through, the place where God brought them into their destiny. I wonder today, do you know where your stones are stacked? I wonder today, are you living your life in a way that you have this honor or this reverence towards the places where God has shaped you and changed you? Do you know on your journey where your stones are stacked? Because if we're not careful, we will forget. How many know our faith suffers when we forget? A lot of us forget all that God has done. A lot of us forget all that God has brought us through. A lot of us forget all that God has changed in our lives because of his grace, because of his mercy, because of his love. I don't know about you, I don't wanna forget. Place matters. I say all of that to say that it's very interesting to me that when I talk to people one-on-one, and you probably noticed this as well, and you talk to somebody who is craving a change or who desires to grow. Let me try to even put it down this way. Somebody today who's watching right now on YouTube, or maybe you're seeing this on Instagram or Facebook, you feel stuck on your journey. I just, I just explained to you that place matters, environment matters. It's, it's massive. You gotta be planted. You gotta be in a healthy environment. You gotta match that sea with soil. But I'm also always amazed when people feel stuck, when people want to change, when people want to grow, how their first reaction so often is to say, you know what I need to do? I need to change the place that I'm in. How many know that you you, you can move your setting, but it doesn't always change your story. And you can have a new place, but you can still have an old perspective. Just because you change your destination doesn't mean that you're still not gonna be disappointed. How many people do this, right? It's like, yo, um, this job is frustrating. You know what I need? I need to move and be placed in a new job and that'll change everything for me. I'd be care- Yo, this, this, this marriage thing, whoa, <laughs> it's harder than I thought. I bet I know what I need to do. I bet the problem is my spouse. And if I could just get placed with a new spouse, then my life would be great. You know what it is? It's like, I'm in that church, but nobody notices the anointing on my life. And it's crazy because they keep asking me to serve in the parking lot, but they don't know how grace anointed I am for the platform. I'm gonna go find a place that'll let me be on the platform before they put me in the parking lot because then I can truly change. I just wanna say it this way to you today. Just because 
You change your place. It doesn't mean that you are in a place to change. Just because you change your place, it doesn't mean that you are in a place to change. Today, I'm talking about the place of change, but I suppose my question as we dive into God's word is, are you in a place to change? Are you even in a place to change? Because just because you change the place doesn't mean that you're gonna be in the place. Today, we're gonna look at three questions that we must ask ourselves to come to the answer around this idea, am I in a place to change? Because it's not enough to want to change. It's not enough to desire to change. No, friends, we actually have to be in the place to change. We're gonna pick up today in Mark chapter one, verse 35. Mark chapter one, verse 35. uh, It says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Three questions you gotta ask yourself today around this idea, am I in a place to change? Question number one is, where's your wilderness? Where's your wilderness? Where's your wilderness? Now let's just pick up, last week we we, we finished uh, our teaching with Jesus calling the first disciples to him. Remember, he goes by the Sea of Galilee, And there he says, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Well, as you continue your reading, we missed maybe two stories. He goes into an area known as Capernaum and quickly he drives out a demon. And then we see him go to uh, to Peter's mother-in-law's house. Hello. (laughs) It's always kind of funny to me, right? Because we we, we quickly find out that Peter um, was married. And if you know anything about um, Catholicism, um, Peter is considered to be the first pope. And so I just want to say, I am following in the Catholic tradition of the first Pope of the Catholic Church, which is, I am married. Thank God. Okay, 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 okay. So, 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 so Jesus goes to, to Peter's mother's house where he actually performs a miracle. She's got a fever and he cures her. And as you can imagine, everybody hears that Jesus cures uh, Mary or Jesus cures Peter's mother. And with that, all of a sudden people start showing up from all over the place with sick people. And so Jesus walks out of the house and he heals all of these people. He is busy at work. So that's what he's just done. But now as he's done that, what he does, the scripture says, as we pick up today in verse 35 is, the scripture says, very early in the morning when it's still dark outside, Jesus gets away to a solitary place to pray. Now, as you read Mark's gospel, what what you're gonna notice is that this is the rhythm of Jesus's life, right? as you study Jesus, which we're all apprentices as we learned last week, what you'll see about the pattern or the rhythm of Jesus's life is that Jesus will retreat in order to return. Jesus will go on the inward journey before going on the outward journey. And as you read Mark's gospel, what you're gonna find out is there's three specific times that we see Jesus praying. It doesn't mean that Jesus only prayed three times. It just we see these three specific moments. The first is the one that we're reading right here in verse 35, that he gets up early in the morning at night. The second, I believe, is in Mark chapter six, where Jesus, he feeds 5,000 people. And after he finishes feeding 5,000 people, he withdraws from the crowd and he goes to a quiet place to pray. The third time is when he's in the garden of Gethsemane and he's got his disciples around him. But remember his question is, can you just keep watch with me for one hour? And although they were present, they slept in his most desperate hour. The three observations that you'll make from all three moments of his prayer is that each time that he prays, he prays at night when it's dark outside and he prays in solitude. Prays in solitude. Now here's what's very, very fascinating to me about this text. As you read the text, what you'll discover is it says that he went off to a solitary place. Everyone say a solitary place. Now, Mark is writing in the Greek language and in the Greek language, solitary place, the word is this word, eremos, eremos. And the word eremos, if you can imagine this for a moment, is the exact same Greek word that's used for when John the Baptist in Mark chapter one is preaching in the desert, AKA wilderness. And it's the same word that is used from our study last week when Jesus is led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Say, Rich, what are you saying? I'm saying today, if you wanna discover, are you in a place to change? My question is, where is your wilderness? 
Where is your secret place with God? Where is your solitary place with God? Where do you get alone with God? What's your quiet place? Everybody needs a wilderness. Everybody needs an Eremos. Everybody, if they're gonna actually go on the journey of change, are gonna have to find time where they spend alone with God. Jesus is alone in the presence of God. He is in the wilderness seeking his heavenly Father. Man, if Jesus needed alone time with God, how much more? <laughs> how much more with you in your car on empty, looking for a job, trying to pay your school bill? How much more are you gonna need alone time with Jesus? Where's your wilderness? Where's your wilderness? Because if you don't have a wilderness, I'm not quite sure you're in the place to change. You can change your place all you want, but you yourself are not in a place to change. Where is your wilderness? Where's your secret place? Everyone knows that the mark of a true friend is that you guys carry secrets. When I was growing up, I grew up in Tacoma, Washington, outside of Seattle, and we had this big, huge front yard, and we actually grew up on a house that was... Uh, right in front of the Puget Sound, and our house was actually on a cliff. And it sounds kind of like treacherous, but it was really cool as a young man because we used to hike down that cliff with all of me and my neighborhood friends. And I remember my neighborhood friends and I, we, we had a fort. And it wasn't an ordinary fort. I mean, making forts is like cool for young boys, but our fort was like, was, was really cool. What we did was, was that we, we dug a hole in the ground and then we wanted our fort not to be visible or public to everybody else. So we dug a hole in the ground and then we got plywood. We laid plywood on top of the hole. We took brush or grass and, and, and all sorts of different types of trees and we laid it on top of the plywood. And then all of me and my friends, there's about three to four of us that could fit down in that hole. We would go down into that hole, put the plywood on top of us and we were in our secret place. <laughs> and the only people who knew where it was located were the friends, were those that were in relationship. I wonder, do you have a secret place with God? 21 days of prayer and fasting has been an invitation for you to change. It's been trying to draw you out of the hustle and the bustle, out of the noise, out of the city, off of Instagram, off of social, turn the music off, leave Netflix for a moment. There is a creator who wants to minister to you, but it happens in the wilderness. I love that fact that Jesus, what? He gets up in the middle of the night. That's what Jesus does. I mean, it's dark outside when Jesus gets up. How many know your wilderness might cost you sleep, but friends, it will gain you rest. I'm telling you, there is something powerful that happens to your soul in the wilderness. We must learn to leave the comfort of the noise and to leave the comfort of the hustle and bustle. And we must have a wilderness place. We must have a secret place with our maker. If you wanna make sure you're in the place to change, you gotta answer the question, where, where's your wilderness? Where's your wilderness? I was thinking, <laughs> it's very interesting to me. Maybe you noticed this, maybe you didn't notice this, but it says very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up left the house and went off to a solitary place. When you read this in the Greek, it is this word, eremos. It's the exact same word as we see just a few verses earlier. But a few verses earlier, how did Jesus end up in the eremos, in the wilderness, in the desert? He was led by the spirit. I just wanted you to catch for a moment, just a picture of what maturity looks like. Not that Jesus needed to mature, but I think that Jesus does things on purpose to show you and I certain moments. A few verses earlier, Jesus was led by the spirit to the Eremos. But a few verses later, it's like he's mature and he's like, all right, the spirit's already led me there. I'm not gonna ask the spirit to lead me to places I already have the directions to. I wonder, do you still require the spirit to drag you to places that you should be walking into on your own accord? I don't know about you, man, but I wanna grow in 2021. 
I don't wanna just keep going back to the same old places. I don't wanna keep having the same old revelation. At some point, you have to mature. At some point, you have to grow. The Spirit leads Jesus. Now, a few verses later, Jesus is like, hey, the Spirit already showed me that place. I know how to get there on my own accord. I'll use my own two feet. I'll set my own alarm clock. I'll get myself up and I will walk myself into the wilderness because I know of its power. I wonder how long are you gonna keep going back to wells that you know will never satisfy you? How many more times this year are you gonna go back to a place that you know will cause you harm, that if it's not for God's spirit dragging you out of that place, you would be destroyed? Come on, there's some things that you already know. Stop looking for happiness in the same place you lost it. The spirit has shown you a whole lot already. You don't need to keep on dialing in the same address saying, I don't remember how to get to that place. Yes, you do. You know how to read your Bible. You know how to seek God on your own. You know how to serve. You know how to give. I wanna go deeper. I wanna go further. I wanna grow bigger. Where's your wilderness? Where's your, where's your wilderness? I'm not gonna ask the spirit to lead me to places that I have already been and I know how to get to. Of course, I am totally dependent upon the spirit, but I just wonder how much of our spiritual journey we cause him to show us places that we already know how to get to. Listen, you can change the place, but just because you change the place doesn't mean that you're in a place to change. Are you in a place to change? That's my question. Environment matters, but I'm just wondering before you change the environment, before you don't, are you even in a place to change? You gotta ask yourself, where's your wilderness? Watch what happens. Mark chapter one, verse 36, just doing Bible study. That's what we're doing in the month of January, probably till, till we get to June, till we get to VU conference. We're just doing Bible study. Mark chapter one, verse 36, watch this. So Simon and his companion, they, they went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, uh, everyone, is looking for you. And Jesus replied, well, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. And so he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. So I just want you to get this picture for a moment because this is really, really interesting. Here's Jesus and uh, he's just healed Peter's mother-in-law, praise God for mother-in-laws. Uh, he's healed a whole town. Now he's gone to bed with his disciples, but now he's, he's left and he's gone to the wilderness. The wilderness is not, a, is not a desert necessarily, a wasteland. When Mark writes about it, he's referring much more to a place of repentance or restoration or relationship with God. So he's getting alone time with God. How, how many know, yo, like if you're gonna change the world, you first need to have your world changed. Now, early morning, I rise, I seek your face. His mercies are new every morning morning. That's what Jesus is doing. But watch what happens. What happens is the disciples, they, they come looking for him. In fact, the way the text is written, it's stressing the idea that they're on the hunt. Like they're, they're looking for him and, and they can't really find him. Maybe you're watching today. And when you describe or think about who God is, your relationship with God, it's like, yo, I feel like God's missing I feel like God's absent. I, I, I don't know where he is. I, I, I can't seem to find God. Can you imagine playing hide and go seek with Jesus? <laughs> that would be difficult, right? <laughs> My son Wyatt right now, he, he's learning the game of hide and go seek. And so he goes, you know, one, two, three, ready or not, here I come to find you. I'm like, dude, when I grew up, it was a lot more numbers than three, you know? <laughs> but I think many times we, we get this idea that, that Jesus is hiding somewhere and we're going one, two, three, ready or not, here I come to find you, but it's actually quite the opposite. Wow. Jesus is not actually lost. In fact, I would say just because you're looking doesn't mean that he's lost. Wow. In fact, Jesus, what does he say? He says, ask and it will be given. Knock and the door will be open. Seek and you will find. The truth of the matter is, is that Jesus is not lost. Guess who's lost? You and I are lost. If we are playing hide and go seek with God, it's not Jesus who's hiding, it's you and me. 
<laughs> Jesus is shouting from heaven. This is what Mark's gospel is about. I've come with good news. One, two, three, ready or not, you can run all you want, but you cannot hide any longer. I will find you. He said, but Rich, they're, they're looking for him. I, I know they're looking for him, but look what the text says. Then they found him. That's good news. That's just because you don't see him for a moment doesn't mean that he's lost. If you keep looking, you will find him. He, he wants to be found by you. I was talking to a friend this past week who's awesome part of our church. And uh, she's in this moment right now where she's got a friend who's, who is an atheist, really doesn't believe in any kind of God. And she was just looking for tips or like, you know, just, hey, how do I even navigate this conversation? And I wanna be of service and I wanna help. You know what I've learned when I've come to different relations that I have with people that are much smarter than me or deep into philosophy, or in some cases, maybe having a paradigm or a thought process, they don't even believe in God. Guess what? The weight is not on your shoulders or my shoulders. All we have to do in those situations is encourage our loved one, our friend to seek him. And if you're out there right now and you're watching and you're like, yo, dude, like I don't trust you, Rich. And I don't trust this live stream on YouTube I'm watching. I don't trust churches or people. All of that is okay. What I would plead with you is do not let any of us mere flesh and blood get in the way of you actually asking the deep questions. Because if you'll simply say, God, if you're real, reveal yourself to me, it might not happen in the time frame that you want, but I promise you, if you come with a searching heart, if you have a desire to meet him, he will reveal himself to you. He wants to be found. He wants to be found. But notice what the disciples do. They find him and when they find him, it's almost like they have this passive aggressive, subtle rebuke going on. Do you notice it? In fact, the scripture said that they exclaimed, which is like, a, I don't know, is that a mild shout? Yeah. Everyone is looking for you. Yeah. And if you see it, they've got an exclamation mark. You know, like if it was just a sentence, it would be a period. It's like texting, right? Do you guys have those friends that text you in all capital letters? Yeah. You're like, what did I do to you? What? I'm so, no, I do not want to fight. I don't want to fight. My dad only texts in capital letters. He's like, Rich, God wants to bless you. I'm like, I feel like God wants to harm me based upon your text, you know? Because it's all capital letters. Well, 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 the exclamation mark is a shout that these guys are mildly rebuking Jesus. How many know? That's a spot you don't really want to be in. They're rebuking Jesus. Yo, everyone is looking for you, bro. Don't you understand, Jesus, what's happening? Everyone wants to meet you. And you're out here in the wilderness, all alone, just doing whatever out here with no one else around. We gotta get going. We got an agenda. There's people to meet. There's people to encourage. You gotta heal more people. Don't you know, everybody wants to meet you. And see, it's very, very important as you read this text that if you're, are you in a place to change? Are you in a place to change? Question number one is, where's your wilderness? But question number two is, what's driving you? What's driving you? Because quickly what we discover as we read this story is we see the motivation of Jesus is much different from the motivation than the disciples. Wow. They come to Jesus and they're like, yo, where, where are you? Everyone's looking for you. We gotta get going. But look at what Jesus, how he responds. He says, let us go somewhere else. No, no, no. I don't think you understood. We came and found you to let you know that they're all over there. They all wanna meet you. And Jesus, his answer is borderline harsh. It's like, no, 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 no. Let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. This is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. It's really, really interesting to me because the disciples are so sure of what Jesus is supposed to do and what Jesus is meant to do. But what I know about life and what I know about humanity is left to ourselves. We will always forsake the important to deal with the urgent. What's driving you? What's motivating you? Because what you quickly see here about Jesus is you quickly see that his methods 2000 years ago are kind of different than the methods that we see of the evangelical church today. Because evangelical church today, and I'm a part of that, we're like, yo, uh, anything for a crowd. Hold on, you tell me there's people lining up out there? You tell me that people wanna do another service, do another event, let's go meet them. Let, 
Let's go get them. It's urgent. We, 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 we go to them. We, we got to get to them. What you discover about Jesus is that his method for ministry is far different than my method or your method. He is not basing his life based upon external results. I remember one time I was talking to a church planner and I'm not a hater, but sometimes I come off like a hater. I was talking to this church planner and nice guy, but he was, he was describing to me how he was getting ready. He had three different cities that he was thinking about planting a church in. I said, what do you mean three different cities you're thinking about planting church? He's like, well, my team, we've come together. And uh, we've done all the reports. Uh, we've done all the, I go, the reports? What are the reports? He's like, we've, we, we've scoured the land. We, we, we've done the census. I don't know if people do yeah. census anymore. He starts going through all this analytics. He's like, we, we, we've researched the people there, that there's a, there's a big group of people that, are, that, that used to be church, but now are unchurched. And we've discovered that they like this type of music. And uh, I've got this person on my team that will reach that style. And uh, we, we, we know the marketing. We're, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna make sure that we blanket all of the, the 40,000 homes with this mailer. And this mailer is gonna produce these results. And, and he was talking and I'm not trying to be a hater. Like, do your work, man. At Voo Church, we got all sorts of tools that we're measuring everything. We wanna be good stewards of what we're doing. But the whole time he was talking, I was just thinking to myself, yo, bro, you do know that you cannot strategize a move of God. You do know that you can't analyze a move of God. You do know that you can't quantify or datify a move of God. God is looking for people that are driven by obedience, not outcomes. God is looking for people that will make sure that they know what they're called to. According to Jesus, he's not looking at the same outcomes that you and I are looking at. According to Jesus, he's trying to live his life out of obedience. Listen to me, just because it can work doesn't mean that it should work. Just because it will grow doesn't mean that it will last. And just because the door is open doesn't mean that you should walk through it. If you wanna be in the place to change, you have to ask yourself the question, what is driving me? What is motivating me? What is the intention of my heart? Why do I wanna succeed? Why do I want to be triumphant? Why? Because what drives you defines you. And what motivates you moves you. And the disciples apparently are driven by crowds, but Jesus is driven by his calling. Can I get a witness from somebody out there today? I don't wanna be driven by the crowd. I don't wanna be driven by the people out there. I wanna do what God has called me to do. Just because it's urgent doesn't mean that it's important. And what Jesus is showing each and every one of us, especially those that wanna be disciples and those that wanna be apprentices and those that wanna actually build the kingdom of God and those that wanna actually inflict change on a broken, lost world, those that actually not wanna be shaped by the culture, but want to shape the culture. Jesus would say, if you live for everyone, you will reach no one. If you live for everyone, you're gonna reach no one. And you look at Jesus, you're like, dude, I know, but all these people, they're here. All these people, they, they, they want you to, to heal them. But what I love about Jesus is Jesus is saying, no, 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 I'm not driven by the same thing that you're driven by. I want you to understand that it's important for me to be in this wilderness. I must retreat in order for me to return. And I have decided and defined that I'm not going to live my life based upon your outcomes. I'm going to live my life based upon obedience to my mission. My motivation has determined my mission. You know what Jesus knew? Jesus knew that those people that were there were there for all the wrong reasons. They wanted a healing, but they didn't want truth. They wanted miracles, but they didn't actually want the man. (laughs) And Jesus is saying, what you guys don't get right now and what is moving you right now is you think that these guys are here and because they're here that we should just set up shop and build the headquarters here and because it's gonna be big and because it's gonna be loud and because it'll be successful to the audience of the public and the crowd, that's why we should do it. But friends, please understand, Jesus would say to you and I, he would say, you guys don't get it. They want my power. (laughs) They don't want my word. So what does he say? He says. Let us go somewhere else. Somewhere else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I know they're there, but like, I know why they're here. I know what's driving them. 
I know what's motivating them. Sure, I can change them from the outside, but I'm not here to change people from the outside in. I'm here to change people from the inside out. I know what's motivating them. So, so let's go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That's why I've come. Isn't that amazing? Jesus is a miracle worker, but it wasn't his mission. His mission was to preach to us the truth. Let me not get lost here in doing external outward miracles. Let me get back onto what is driving me and what is motivating me. It's to preach, to preach the truth. Number one, where's your wilderness? Number two, what's driving you? Mark chapter one, verse 40. It says, a man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees. If you are willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately, everyone say immediately. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cured. Are you in a place to change? Are you in a place to change? Where's your wilderness? What's driving you? But number three, really simple question. Are you willing to do what you have never done? Because it's not enough to change your place if you're not in a place to change. I love this man because this man, it's hard for us to get the context, but Jesus has been in the wilderness. Jesus has now left a whole crowd of people that were begging at him and clawing at him and saying, heal me, heal me. He said, no, I gotta go preach. And as he's preaching, there's this man with leprosy. We don't get his name, we get his condition. Ever felt like that in life? People don't see you, don't know your identity, don't know the real you. All they see is your condition. All they see is the color of your skin. All they see is your outward appearance and they label you and they categorize you. What I love about Jesus is that he doesn't do that. He looks deeper within to discover who we actually are. And here's this man, he's got leprosy. It's hard to really understand the weight of what leprosy means. But leprosy is a skin condition, really a skin disease. And in the ancient world, it was a death sentence. As you read certain stories, what happens is that at times as it gets worse, that your limbs actually begin to fall off. Not, Not only was it a physical death sentence, maybe at times the more painful thing was that it was a It was a society death sentence, that you became an outcast, that you were a cultural outcast. As you you study the Torah, a lot of you this year are committing to read your Bible for one year straight. We do pretty good with Genesis. I like that, there's Noah's Ark. and I love Joseph and his dream, that's a cool story. We do pretty good with Exodus. Oh wow, there's Moses, I like this guy. Numbers, oh my goodness, Joshua and the spies. Deuteronomy, this is okay, this is getting kind of weird. And you get to like Leviticus right there. Leviticus and Deuteronomy, you're like, all right. Um, do I believe this? <laughs> what did I get myself into with this church? Because in Leviticus, you start to see the ceremonial laws. If you study Leviticus 13 and 14, In fact, I'd even encourage you as you're listening to this message, go back, look at it, read it. You will see two full chapters of descriptive rules and regulations for men and women who had leprosy. And what you will find is that if you had leprosy, you were a social outcast. You couldn't live in the city. You had to live outside the city. In fact, what you'll find out is that they had to keep their distance. And that wasn't a subjective amount of distance. The scripture tells us that it was 50 paces. You ever walked out 50 paces? Like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. We keep going, just that's 10. At a distance they had to keep, 50 paces. And anywhere that they came in where someone actually came into that sphere or that, that, that perimeter, they had to announce themselves, unclean, unclean. Those are the words they had to shout. So if they're minding their own business and you walk into their 50, whoa, 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 unclean, unclean. Just want you to see the picture of what this man is carrying all his life. It's a powerful story because as you read it, something about this day changed in this man. The rules, the ceremonial laws 
was very clear. You got to keep your distance. And as you step into somebody's circumference, you better announce you are unclean. But on this day, as this man saw Jesus, he's drawn to him and he runs to him. I can imagine him going, unclean, 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 50 paces, unclean, unclean, 50 paces, unclean, unclean, until he finally finds himself on his knees at the feet of Jesus. And he says, if you're willing, you can make me clean. It's amazing because we don't recognize how much shame and guilt was attached to this man's life. But I know this to be true that there's many of you watching right now. And the reason why you don't move forward from weakness to strength is because it'd be too embarrassing to admit the problems. It'd be too embarrassing to unearth the fact that I am unclean. But I'm telling you friends, if you wanna get something you've never had before, you're gonna have to be able to do something you've never done before. I'm weak. I'm ashamed, I'm afraid, I'm scared, I'm unclean. But if you're willing, if you're willing, Jesus, you can make me clean. I know it, I know it, I know it. They say insanity is defined by doing the same thing over and over again and expecting new results. I don't know how to preach it to you any better. I wish you were all in front of me. I wish I could throw my sweat on you. I wish I could spit on you. I wish you could see how passionate I am right now. But some of you, you gotta hear me. This year ain't gonna look any different unless you do something different. Your marriage, it's gonna look the same as 2020 unless you do something different. Your kids, the same, unless you do something different. This man on this day, he's like, oh, I'm done hiding. This is my moment to change. I just got to get to the place where Jesus is. I just got to get to the place where Jesus is, but it's going to cost me announcing for 50 paces, I am unclean and I am unclean and I am unclean and I am unclean, but I have decided that the announcement of my weakness is worth the cost of me receiving new strength in Jesus. How long are you going to hide? How long are you gonna fake it till you make it? How, how's that going for you? How long are you gonna act like it's all good? How long are you gonna live your life through Instagram filters, projecting a life that does not exist? You can change place as many times as you want. New marriage, new job, new city, new destination, new family, new car, new shoes. But just because you've changed the place doesn't mean that you're in the place to change. This man, he, he believed that Jesus was able. He just wasn't confident that he was willing. Oh, I love Jesus. Because here's this man, falls on his feet. Can you make me clean? I, I believe you can make me clean. Just, are you willing to do it? I love Jesus. Oh, we don't get it because Jesus was a rabbi. It's just hard for us to understand, but Jesus immediately, the scripture actually says that he looked upon him with compassion. Another translation says he was indignant, which is probably a better translation because as you study the text, what you'll find out that the ancient manuscripts said that he was, he looked upon him with anger. Didn't look at the man with anger, but indignation is this idea that I'm so fed up. It's like Jesus is like, I'm so angry. I have such righteous anger about this thing called the fall of humanity, which has resulted in disease and sin. And if you wanna know my feeling about it, a good modern day NIV translation is compassion. But if you wanna to go to old school church, Jesus is like, I'm angry about it. And I'm angry that there's a humanity that would even wonder if I am willing. And the scripture says that he, he touches the man, which, doesn't seem like much to you, but you got to realize that the moment he touched the man, according to the ceremonial laws, that the rabbi himself now became unclean also. But here's what's so cool about Jesus is Jesus, he supersedes the law. Jesus is the Lord of the ceremony. He's the master of the ceremony. What do you mean, Rich? If he touched him, isn't that him breaking the law? No. You ever been, um, maybe going down US1 here in Miami, all the people that are living in Miami, 
And as you live in Miami, US-1 has always got all sorts of just different things happening traffic wise. I was driving the other day on US-1 and I got to this light and, and the light was working, but I don't know if there was an accident or something like that, but there was two police officers in the street and the police officers now were having to wave people through the lights. And what was amazing is, you know, has this ever happened to you before? The police officer was saying, come, come on, come on through. <laughs> but the light, the light was red. And I was like, um, we good? Cause I know like, I don't wanna be, I don't want you to get in a camera and flip this on me, you know? <laughs> Police officer said, no, I'm, I'm here. You can come on through. Why? Because the presence of the officer, according to our written law says that when the officer is present, he supersedes the written law. He can enforce the written law he can judge the written law. And if he changes the written law in that moment, you better obey the officer. And you say, how on earth could Jesus touch this man who's unclean? It's because Jesus is above the sickness. Jesus is above the law. Jesus, he comes and he touches the areas of our life that are unclean. You're saying, yo, I think, I think Jesus is ashamed of my shame and you would be mistaken. He came to touch the areas that you're ashamed of. He came to touch the areas that you're not proud of, the areas that you're hiding, the areas that you're covering up. This is the God who touches us. And I love it because in one moment, we see another picture of Genesis chapter one as we keep talking about it. How did God create? He created with his words. In the same way that he raised Lazarus from the dead, in the same way he created the heavens and the earth, when Jesus heals, when Jesus changes, when Jesus transforms, he doesn't have to find a magic wand. He doesn't have to get a whole bunch of potions together. He doesn't have to come up with some sort of script. All he has to do is speak it into existence. And as he touches the man, he says, I am willing, but not only am I willing, he declares, be clean, and immediately the man was cured. Oh, come on, somebody, give him praise. Immediately, the man was cured. His leprosy was away, and he was cured. I love Jesus, because Jesus says, yes, I can, and yes, I will. Yes, I can, and yes, I will. Yes, I can heal it, and yes, I will heal it. I know they told me I'm not supposed to touch you, but I don't have to listen to them. I'm here on assignment of obedience, and I came to touch areas that they told me that society said I'm not supposed to touch. I wonder if we could build a church that would say, you know what, we're gonna touch some areas that others have told us we can't touch. I wonder if we could be a church that says, we're gonna stand in the gap, and we're gonna be a church that says, whoever you are, whatever you got going in your life, every broken area, every hang up, you belong here. We will embrace and we will cover you. Yes, I can and yes, I will. Yes, I can and yes, I will. I can and I will. And if you wanna know what heaven is shouting over your life today, heaven is shouting, yes, I can and yes, I will. It's the place of change. If I can just get to the place where Jesus is, then I know he will say, yes, I can and yes, I will. Yes, I can, and yes, I will. I suppose I'm preaching so hard because I want to establish, as you're answering these questions today, am I in a place to change? My question was, are you willing to do what you've never done? So the man was wondering if Jesus was willing, but let me just encourage. Jesus says, yes, I can, and yes, I will. So for a moment, can we put that to the side? Jesus is willing. My question is, what are you willing to do? What are you willing to do? It's not a lot, you just gotta, you gotta expose your secrets. You gotta expose your weakness. You gotta say, I'm unclean, I'm unclean. But if you're willing, you can make me clean. You can change your place, but it doesn't mean that you're in a place to change. Are you in a place to change? Where's your wilderness? What's driving you? Are you willing to do this year what you've never done before? We'll close with this. Mark chapter one, verse 43. 
We'll go to the end of the passage here. I want you to see this. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer the sacrifice that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Now, what I love is, is that Jesus, he just broke the ceremonial law, but now Jesus is reinforcing the ceremonial law. That if you had leprosy and you thought that you were cured somehow, the only person that could declare that you were clean is the priest. Very important to note that Jesus commands the man, go to the priest and make sure the priest says that you've been cleansed. What I love is, is the priest has the authority to call out cleansing, but it's only Jesus who has the authority to cure you completely. He says, go to the priest, let them know. Don't, don't tell anyone, he says. Don't, don't tell anyone what happened here. But look at this man. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. It really makes me laugh because um, so many times in church, it's like, you know what we need to do? We need to teach evangelism. We should, we should do like a seven week series on evangelism. Evangelism 101, evangelism 201, and of course, evangelism 301 and 401, how to talk to people, how to share your faith. I'm not against it, I'm being a hater today. I know this whole sermon's about me being a hater, but, but what's crazy is that how many know that when you get touched by Jesus, even when Jesus tells you not to share what he's done, you can't help but open your big mouth saying, hey, I know a guy who changed my life forever. Keep it right here. Keep, nah, 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 don't, don't tell anybody. I'm not supposed to say anything. No, no. Evangelism is a result of the gospel changing your life. Instead, he went out and he began to talk freely, spreading the news. I want you to see this. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, watch this, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. We will talk in the coming weeks, coming months, that you will see this pattern of Jesus that when he heals people, when he saves people, all throughout the gospel of Mark, he, he commands them not to say a word. He said, Rich, why would he ever do that? Well, there's lots of reasons. We'll talk about it more in the coming weeks. Some of the reasons are because uh, there was so many misconceptions around the Messiah. He didn't want false rumors going around. He didn't want people controlling the narrative that he came to control. He, he also knew that, that, that faith could not be coerced from a spectacle, that we don't come to follow Jesus just because he can do miracles on the outside. We, we come to follow Jesus because he changes us from the inside. We don't follow Jesus because we can have a happy life. We follow Jesus because he declares in me, you can have a happy eternity. <laughs> But I suppose the biggest reason why scholars believe that he did not want people to say anything is because ultimately you cannot know Jesus until he gets to the other side of the cross. To talk about Jesus without the cross, well, you would be missing the whole point. Because friends, the cross is the place of change. The cross reminds you and I that he is more than some moral teacher. The cross reminds us that he is so much deeper than just some noble human being. He's, he's more than just some peacemaker. He, he, he's more than a miracle worker. He's, he's more than a leadership guru. All of those things he is. But the cross shows you and I that Jesus is the son of God who came in the form of a humble servant that would what? That would take the place of our sins on the cross. What is the cross? The cross is the place of change. And Jesus was like, until I get to that cross, I don't want you guys going and sharing just half the message because I came with the gospel, the good news. And there's not gonna be any good news until I go to that place where I must die so that you may live. Wow. I must go and be stretched wide and hung high that you might find life and life more abundantly. The cross is the place of change. We wear crosses around our neck. 
Why? Because a cross around your neck or a cross on your wall or a cross in your car, what is it? It's like a stone when we cross the River Jordan. We place it around our neck. We place it in our home because we remember, we commemorate, we honor, we revere. That's the place of change. That's the place of change. So I don't know if you saw it, but it's important that you see it. Jesus touches the man, Jesus cleanses the man, and Jesus says, don't go tell anybody about this. But the man can't keep his mouth shut. He starts sharing good news, and with it, Jesus is driven where? Where is Jesus driven to? Verse 45, it says this, as a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Someone say lonely places. The story begins with Jesus in the wilderness as an insider in the presence of God. But the story ends with Jesus as an outsider in not a solitary place, but a, a lonely place. But isn't this the gospel? That the outsider known as the leper who was outside the city, who lived his whole entire life as an outcast. One touch from Jesus and the outcast, well, he got to change places with Jesus. And the outsider becomes the insider who's clean. And the insider known as Jesus now becomes the outsider in the lonely place. Why? Because the best way I can say it is that the place of change is a change of place. place of change is a change of place. A change of place, what do you mean, Rich? Yeah, that's the gospel. That Jesus didn't just die for you on that cross. Oh, friend, it is so much better than that. He died as you. This story is not the story of a leper, some guy. This is the story of you, and this is the story of me. That every one of us, we are the outcasts. We are the lepers. We are unclean. But thank God for His grace. Thank God for his mercy. Thank God for Jesus in action. Thank God for the gospel that Jesus Christ, he came and declared, guess what? The place of change is the moment that I change places with you. I'm gonna change you from the inside out. I'm gonna take your death so that you can get my life. You're gonna receive my reward and I will take your consequence. Is there anybody out there who's grateful for the cross of Jesus Christ that at the cross, Everything changed at the cross. He took my place. Come on, if you believe it. Give God some praise, come on. Hey, Rich Wilkerson here. I want to say a big thank you for watching today's content, believing and trusting that it impacted you. And if it did help you or it encouraged in any way, I would love for you to like it and share it with some other people. Make sure to subscribe to the VU Church YouTube page where you can get more content just like this. And while you're there, Go peruse the gallery, as they say, and see past talks and past content that I believe is gonna help you. I love you. Best is yet to come.